All right, good afternoon. We'd like to uh, welcome you to our uh, latest educational uh, forum here for Impel Wealth Management. Uh, you've got myself, Jesse Hurst, Certified Financial Planner, CEO here of Impel Wealth Management. I'm joining you here from, uh, from my home office, uh, safe and socially distanced from Nathan, who is uh, Nathan Olish, Certified Financial Planner, who's manning the, uh, manning the ship back at the uh, offices of Impel Wealth and will be, uh, uh, I may refer to him a couple of times, and he's going to be uh, managing uh, Q&A for us which we'll be able to do throughout today's session. So we'd like to, first of all, thank everybody for joining us. We've got, uh, you know, like I said before, quite a few people joining from all over the country. So it's always gratifying to know that you've got a platform where you can't just, you know, you're not only reaching people who are just around the corner from you, but you're reaching people that uh, otherwise would not have been able to come to like a local town hall meeting. So it's great to be able to use technology that way. And we're happy to have so many people joining us. You know, just uh, as a format for today's session, just wanted to give everybody kind of a little bit of a heads up on that. We're going to do about 30 minutes, give or take, of uh, presentation. Uh, we've got some background on from both a historical, economic, and political backdrop. And uh, from there, then we're going to open it up for Q&A. And uh, as we looked at uh, coming up with a title for today's, uh, today's session, you know, we, uh, we came up with this idea of 2020, what else could go wrong, right? It's like we've been through everything else this year, what else could happen? And, uh, you know, we sit back and think about where we were in January, February of this year, and everything was humming along great. And everybody thought that the election was really going to come down to a referendum on how, how well the economy was doing versus what the outcome of the impeachment trial that was still going on in January would, would look like. And nobody had really nobody had a, a big clue as to what was going to start happening 30, 40 days later. So uh, as we as we take a look at uh, living through everything we have this year, viral outbreaks, you know, pandemics, economic shutdowns, uh, social unrest, and so forth. It's kind of like, what else could go wrong? Well, next thing you know, we have an election coming up here um, in just a few weeks, and we want to talk about what that could mean for you, what that could mean for the economy, what it could mean for the markets, and what's your likely best course of action going forward. So um, from there, um, we do have uh, just our disclaimer page here that we have to put up just to say, hey, the, the opinions voiced here are our opinions. You know, all performance is historical. There's no guarantee of future results and the risk considerations and so forth involved with investing. So, so that's our compliance disclaimer page. And with that, I'll just spend a, a couple of moments giving you a little bit of background about myself. For those of you who don't know me, I know we have a lot of clients on the call, but we have some people that are not clients on the call. Um, you know, I started in the business in 1987 and uh, have been a certified financial planner since 1994. Uh, I'm a, an accredited investment fiduciary, an AIF. Uh, we've also been blessed enough to have the team at Impel Wealth Management be recognized by Forbes, well, uh, Forbes Magazine as one of the top wealth management firms in the state of Ohio for three years running. Uh, Nathan has very similar credentials to myself, although uh, he still has hair and I don't. So he's been in this a few fewer years than I have. But, uh, you know, our goal is to really help people in a couple of ways, right? First is to help people uh, develop the plans to make the uh, transition from work life to retirement life in a successful way. Help them put together the, the flight plans or you know, sometimes we use the analogy of a custom made suit. It doesn't matter if it fits anybody else's situation, it just has to fit you and your family's financial situation. And then really to help people do two things. One is to accumulate the resources they're going to need to meet their retirement income goals. And number two is to help people manage those resources that they've accumulated so that they can create the income they need to do the things that they want to do that gives life meaning and purpose and value as they transition into the next phase of life. So uh, with that brief background, we'll jump right in today. You know, when we talk about what else could possibly go wrong, 
we start here, and this was a really interesting chart that I saw about 60 days ago, and it talks about from 1900, over the last 120 years, if you look at what are considered super disruptors, things such as a recession, a pandemic, mass protests and social unrest, and intense partisan political election seasons, there have been three years in the last 120 years that we had three of those four going at the same time. It's kind of interesting in all of these years, you had a pandemic and protests, but you never had all four going concurrently until this year. And that makes this year unprecedented. And I always say, we've used the word unprecedented an unprecedented number of times this year. And here is why that's actually true. So if you feel like you're living in times that nobody's ever lived through before, you actually are. So um, it's been very interesting, but as we start taking a look at those super disruptors and what they mean to our markets and our economy, and especially as we focus on the upcoming election, we want you to know a few things. You know, a lot of people think we've never seen uh, contentious elections, we've never seen this much vitriol in, in the uh, uh, political process. But it, it's actually funny that, that it's, it's actually been that way a lot of history. The big difference is, is that what you didn't always have was a 24 hour news cycle and you didn't have social media fanning the flames of it. So it wasn't in your face all the time. But even George, you know, even, even people like George Washington said that newspapers are filled with all the invective that disappointment, ignorance of facts and malicious falsehoods could invent to mis misrepresent my politics. So George Washington did not have a love affair going on with the, uh, with the media and the newsprint. And obviously it took a long time for, for news to hit the newspapers and get out to the general public but he obviously was not in, uh, in love with the, with the press all the time, even as founder of our country. And as author of the Declaration of Independence and one of the brightest uh, political minds that, that's ever been, Thomas Jefferson said, nothing can be, be believed which is seen in a newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being put into that polluted vehicle. So when you have people like uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, uh, saying that they misrepresent my politics, that, that newspapers are pollu polluted vehicles. I, it would be interesting to see what they would think of 24-hour cable news cycles and social media. And at the end of the day, as bad as things are today, and things are bad, and things are contentious, and things are very divided, you know, you think back to uh, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, uh, for those of you who've seen the musical, know that it ends not well for Alexander Hamilton, who dies in a duel over political battles. And so uh, with the, with the you know, vice, former vice president, so as, as, as we take a look at this, as long as, as long as we're sitting in a place where Mike Pence and, uh, and, um, you know, his opponent are not out there dueling it out over, uh, over what's going on politically. We're actually more civil today than we were, you know, a couple hundred years ago, even though it doesn't feel like that in the face of, uh, of what we see with the media every day. So it's bad, but it's been bad before, and it's been bad uh, consistently at different points in time throughout history. So moving on from there, um, one of the things that's really kind of interesting is a lot of people on, especially people who are more conservative, more uh, leaning on the right, are very concerned that we're going to see a, a real re-engineering of the economy, especially if more left-leaning or progressives get into control of Congress. But as you see uh, Congress in the White House, but as you can see from this, uh, consumer personal consumption, which is the dark blue up here at the top, uh, business investment and so forth, and government expenditures, those things really have remained remarkably steady over the last 75 years or so, 73 years, um, since the end of World War II. And that's throughout Democratic 
administrations, Republican administrations, that's throughout thing, things that were massive changes, like the Great Society, you know, when, when we put into place Medicare and Medicaid for everyone, when we went through the Economic Recovery Tax Act in 1981 with uh, President Reagan, or, you know, we had the Personal Responsibility for Work Opportunity Act uh, under the Clinton administration, the Affordable Care Act. Many people thought that these landmark legislations would completely change the economy, would completely change mm -hmm. consumer and business behavior. But you can see, by and large, they didn't spike in any meaningful way. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the chart below, what you'll see is that the Dow Jones Industrial Average since 1926 has averaged about 10% a year. And yeah, there were hiccups in the, in the Great Depression. You know, we've, we've had, it's kind of funny. I started in the business in 1987. And when you take a look at it here, the, the hiccup you see in the markets um, right here is the stock market crash of 87, which was a major event shortly after I started in the business. And it's barely a blip in the, in the historical screen that you can see now. So it's really interesting to see the impact of, of these legislative agendas and what people thought it was going to do to the economy and the markets that simply turned out not to be true over time. All right. Let's move on from there. The other thing we want people to be aware of is that signature legislation, you know, uh, the, the, the Tax Reform Act of 86 under Reagan or the Affordable Care Act that was signed into, uh, signed into being by uh, President Obama, or if you take a look at the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017 that was signed into law in late 17, uh, December of 17 by President Trump, a lot of people thought these things would significantly change the economy. You know, a lot of people thought that when President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act, that it was going to destroy small business employment. They just thought that small businesses wouldn't be able to afford health insurance, therefore they wouldn't hire people or they'd try to keep people on a part-time basis or they'd try to keep people in places where they had less than 50 employees so that they wouldn't have to participate. But actually, um, from, from the time this legislation was signed in 2010, up through the end of 2019, over 8.6 million jobs were created. So while a lot of people on the right thought that this was going to be a huge destroyer of jobs, it didn't really happen. There were 8.6 8 million jobs created during this time period. Same things when we take a look at the Tax Reform, uh, you know, tax, reform uh, tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017, signature legislation of President Trump. A lot of people thought that by lowering business taxes, and there was a lot of criticism for lowering business taxes. They thought that people on the left thought that, that the Trump administration was giving handouts to wealthy, but you gotta remember that the people who are business owners are the people who employ the people on this chart here and create the jobs. However, a lot of people thought that when this legislation was signed and what it essentially did was it brought the US corporate tax rate in line with the rest of the industrialized world because our rates were far higher, which was why so many companies were, were um, settling, domic you know, setting up domicile overseas, whether it was in Mexico, whether it was in Europe, whether it was in Southeast Asia. It did bring companies back to the United States, but it did not unleash capital spending like we thought it was going to. A lot of people thought that US capital goods orders when this legislation was signed was gonna take off, but for a lot of people, they, it just didn't. And a lot of that went into paying down debt. Some of it went into paying dividends. Some of it went into share buybacks, which are not very popular with a lot of people. Uh, but it's, it's interesting that in both of these situations, the outcome that people expected is not the outcome they got. Now, another really interesting thing as we take a look at it is that markets really don't care 
who, whether, whether a president is popular to give you a good rate of return. And when you take a look at this, this is the Gallup presidential approval rating poll. And I can remember in, in 1991, after, president, uh, after the first Persian Gulf War, President uh, Bush's, Dad Bush's, Bush 41, um, his, his approval rating was as high as any president we had ever seen. And because of a recession after the war, he lost the presidency very shortly thereafter. Um, so, so popularity isn't everything, which Donald Trump is probably very, very grateful for. <laughs> and, uh, but this is the other thing that's really interesting. When presidential approval ratings are in the 30 to 50 percentile, the average gain per year in the stock market is the highest, 15.3% a year, and about 36% of the time that approval ratings in that range. So even when the approval ratings are much higher, you can see that the gain per year in the stock market is not necessarily correlated to how popular the president is. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, President, president uh, Bush, Dad Bush, and then Son Bush, both had very high approval ratings after the first Persian Gulf War and after 9-11, but it didn't result in very good stock market returns. So the moral of the story is, we don't wanna let ourselves get confused that whether or not a president is popular is going to necessarily create great investment returns on a going forward basis. What does really help um, investment returns on a going forward basis is monetary policy. So when we think about monetary policy, we need to think about the Federal Reserve Bank. You know, there's an old Wall Street adage that says, don't fight the Fed. And what that means is, is when the Federal Reserve Bank is easing financial conditions, stock markets tend to do pretty well. During this time period from 08 to 2020, while, the, while financial conditions and monetary conditions as engineered by the Federal Reserve Bank got easier, the stock market did very well during that time period. During the 90s, as, as financial conditions got easier, the stock market did very well during that time period. As financial conditions got tighter in the 2000s, the stock market still went up, but not nearly as much as when, the stock when financial conditions were getting easier. Now, something, I'm gonna take a moment and explain something here I'm gonna pop off this for just a moment because I think this is really important. This is something that, that was a major shift when we talk about don't fight the Fed. This was a major shift in Fed policy and almost nobody's heard about this because it wasn't followed. It's, it's a little technical and people didn't follow it too much in the papers. But in 2012, every year in August, the Federal Reserve Bank does um, a symposium in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And um, in 2012, when Ben Bernanke was, was Federal Reserve Bank president, the Fed for the first time targeted what their inflation target was. It was 2%. And what it was meant to say is if inflation started to rise above 2%, that was the signal that would, that would sound the alarm and the Fed would start raising interest rates. It's part of the reason that the Federal Reserve Bank started raising interest rates in 2000. 15, 16, 17, 18, and what the Fed has subsequently in a recent study that they put out indicated is that um, by raising interest rates so quickly, it choked off economic growth, and what it really did was it choked off job growth, especially for lower wage people, which they think adds to income disparity in the United States. So what the Fed said in August, and it sounds like a very minor change, that instead of having a two, an implicit 2% target, the Fed is going to allow inflation to asymmetrically average 2%. And when you say, what's that mean? Basically what it means is, is if inflation runs below 2% for a period of time, the Fed is now willing to let inflation run above 2% for a period of time before they raise interest rates. So the Fed is now saying when we hit two, that doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna raise rates, 
we are going to let this run hot to make up for all the time that it ran below 2%. That may not sound like a big, big deal, but what it does, um, I gotta get back to my, uh, gotta get back to the right screen here. <laughs> all right, and that was, it popped off. So I'm gonna have to move back to the right chart there, Nate. Give me just a second. What that basically means from that standpoint is, there we go. What that basically means is that over on a going forward basis, we are likely to see easier financial conditions for longer periods of time from the Federal Reserve Bank. Over time, this should be constructive for risk assets, which would be stocks, uh, commodities, even real estate from that standpoint. So it's something we're gonna have to take into account. And we personally think that what the Fed's doing and what monetary policy is, what financial conditions mean, is probably far more important than whether or not the president is popular. Moving on from there, something that we're going to see a lot of talk about in the near future, we've seen talk about it at different points in time, is the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling has been raised multiple times over the last 40 years and um, we are now sitting, and this, this chart is actually just a little bit dated. When I say a little bit dated, it's dated six months ago before the stimulus of the CARES Act came out. Uh, and right now, if you've seen the papers today, last couple days over the weekend, one of the things you'll notice is that um, uh, Nancy Pelosi and then the House Democrats who had passed a hero's uh, additional stimulus act that was almost three and a half trillion dollars and uh, and uh, everybody came back and said you know no we're not going to do that um, you know the Republicans in the Senate and and President Trump said we're not going to do that now they've come back and said well we're willing to drop it to 2.2 trillion the Republicans are around one and a half trillion, 1.3, 1.5 trillion. We'll see if Speaker Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin are able to come to some sort of deal. But with the stimulus that's been passed so far this year, we're seeing this, this um, debt that started the year around 22 trillion already pushing between 25 and 26 trillion. If they get another two trillion of stimulus passed, we could see the federal debt at somewhere in around 28 trillion before long. And I've seen a couple studies recently that think we'll be at 40 trillion by 2030, which in it could happen sooner than that. Uh, the interesting thing, and Nathan and I've had some long conversations about this from a historical standpoint, is if you go back to this period of time, right? The late 90s, early 2000s, we actually had four years where we actually ran budget surpluses. And this is something I've been meaning to write an article about, but it's a little complex. This chart, this chart uh, I think helps explain it a little bit. In, in, from 1998, 99, 2000, and 01, we, we ran budget surpluses and the debt did not go up. And in, and in, secret, in, in um, testimony before Congress, in 2001, shortly before 9-11, uh, then uh, um, Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Alan Greenspan said, look, the national debt's around four or five trillion dollars. With the surpluses that we are gathering every year, we think that by 2010, the debt will be paid off and the United States won't have any debt. This is Alan Greenspan, and this is 19 years ago. He thought that the, the debt would be completely obliterated by 2010, and that the biggest issue that the United States was gonna have to figure out at that point in time is do we take the money we're no longer paying on the debt, and do we invest it in infrastructure for the future, or do we give the private sector and individuals massive tax cuts? There was no thought in his mind that literally seven, eight years later that we'd be sitting at more than $12 trillion of debt um, as a result of the financial crisis. And today we're at 26 pushing towards 30 trillion. 
from where we were just 19 years ago. This is something that has happened under Republicans and Democrats, and it's something that's going to have to be addressed and something that we're paying an enormous amount of, of attention to. So with that, sorry, that was probably a little technical, but that was, that was my soapbox moment for the day. That's one of my, my hot issues because nobody remembers that just 19 years ago, we were talking about the United States having no debt and now we're pushing towards 30 trillion and it really doesn't seem like, uh, like people are paying that much attention to it. So now what we don't want people to do is take what they read in the newspapers and especially what they read on social media and think it's objective market analysis. It's just really not. Um, there is one indicator that has historically been a good indicator of whether or not a president will get uh, reelected. It's called the misery Inde index, and it's a combination of inflation and unemployment. And this was something that came into being back in the late 70s um, under Jimmy Carter. You saw it somewhat under uh, President Nixon, but again under Jimmy Carter, when inflation was running in double digits and unemployment was the same, and that misery index got north of 20. The interesting thing is, is if you went back four or five months ago, we've not had any inflation. As a matter of fact, inflation's been running flat to slightly negative during most of this year. Uh, I think, Nathan, I think the most recent uh, CPI numbers year over year are running, what, about 1%? Yeah, right around 1%. Yep. Yeah, so the inflation part wasn't an issue. But when we went through the shutdowns in early this year, starting in March, April of this year, there were a lot of people that thought the unemployment component of this was going to get to 25 or 30 percent. It peaked out around 15 percent. And a lot of people at that point in time thought that unemployment was going to be double digits for at least the next year. And to everyone's surprise, unemployment's now sitting at 8.3 percent. The last unemployment report before the presidential election comes out this Friday because it always comes out the first Friday of the month and the next unemployment report will come out three days after the presidential election. Um, so this, this jobs report on Friday is going to be very important. Um, Nathan, did you see the ADP numbers today for the private payrolls? Yeah. Yeah, it came in better than expected. It was like uh, 747,000 jobs created versus 600,000 expected. Yeah, so there was a big upside surprise. And we've seen that for most of the last five months, that everybody thought we'd still have double digit unemployment. Today, we're sitting at 8.3. That number could drop lower on Friday. We'll continue to watch the participation rate. But today, that misery index with inflation at 1% and unemployment at 8.3% um, puts the misery index at just below 10, significantly less than it was just a few months ago. That's helpful for in, in the incumbent getting reelected. So we'll have to watch the direction of where that's going because when the direction is going the wrong way, the incumbent generally loses so, that, so if we were six months ago, this was definitely going the wrong way. It's going the right way now. The question is, will it go far enough, fast enough to help President Trump in that situation? So it will be very, very interesting to see. I did see a really interesting statistic yesterday that said if you took the two biggest states out of, out of the United States, New York and California, uh, the unemployment rates in, in those states uh, both have significantly stronger lockdowns than we have here in the United States at the present, uh, throughout most of the rest of the United States. They have much more severe restriction on small business, restaurants, and so forth, and reopenings. The unemployment rate in both of those states are, I think, New York's 12.5%, 12.3%, and California's around 11.5%. If you took those two states out, the unemployment rate for the other 48 states is about seven, I think it was 7.7%. The interesting thing was, was that New York and California literally account for 18% of the US population, but they account for 32% of the unemployment. 
So it's one of those things that we've got to pay attention to. But even with that, you can see that the markets have moved forward. And in both cases, right, in 2009, there, Michael Boskin basically said, look, if Obama gets elected, the, his radical thought process is going to kill the stock market. And that didn't happen. And Mark Cuban, the owner of the, who, who's he owned, Nathan? Dallas Mavericks. Dallas Mavericks, I forgot. I knew it was a Texas team. Dallas Mavericks, right? Uh, economist, uh, entrepreneur, small business owner, owns the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, Mark Cuban, who is no lover of Donald Trump, says, in the event Donald wins, I have no doubt in my mind that the stock market will tank. And that didn't happen until coronavirus happened. So, so for everything you hear in the media and social media, don't let it take you off course from a well-designed, well-diversified portfolio that's, help, that's meant to help you meet you and your family's financial goals. Now, last couple things, and then we're going to head towards questions here in just a couple moments. Um, if you take a look at this, this is kind of interesting. From July 31st to October 31st, if the stock market went up, the person who was the incumbent won 72% of the time. So if we take a look at the stock market from July 31st to now, it's actually up. It was up huge in October, pulled back in early, early September, and has bounced back uh, about half of that. But we're still certainly higher today than we were July 31st. There's still six, seven weeks to go, but we're going to have to pay attention because if you, were, if you were a betting person or you were a baseball player and your batting average was 720, you, that, that'd be a pretty good percentage. So this is something we're going to pay attention to is it's certainly no guarantee, but it's another, it's another tea leaf that we're looking at to determine where things might go with this going forward. Now, from a historical standpoint, I think this is really important because this goes back to Great Depression days, Democratic administrations, Republican administrations, and you can see things in this like the latter part of the Great, uh, Great Depression. You can see things like the 73-74 Arab oil embargo. Uh, the stock market crash of 87, again, is just a little blip on the map. But you can see here the dot-com, 9-11, Enron, WorldCom drop, the 0708 financial subprime mortgage and financial crisis. But the trend through this has been whether you have a Democrat or Republican in the White House, the markets move up over time. I remember when I started in this business back in 1987, Somebody showed me a chart like this. Obviously, it stopped here in 1987. And they said, if you look at this chart, it's like watching somebody walk up a hill bouncing a yo-yo. You want to pay attention to the slope of the hill, not the yo-yo. You don't want to get too caught up on the day-to-day -day because time and market and, and free market economies and, and ingenuity and so forth is what drives things, not who's sitting in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The other thing is, is that president markets have performed well, whether there were Democrats in the White House or, or if there were Republicans in the White House. If you take a look at it from this standpoint, this is the average return of the stock market. This is the average GDP growth. So it's kind of interesting that under Johnson and Kennedy, GDP growth was really strong and stock market performance was around 10% a year. But you know everybody kind of thinks of Gerald Ford as not like the greatest president in the world. And while GDP wasn't great, the stock market averaged more than 20% a year under his tenure. The stock market did extremely well under Dad Bush, under Eisenhower and under Obama. It did very well under Reagan and Clinton. And if you take a look at it, over the last 75 years, the stock market measured by the S&P 500 has averaged about 11% a year over time periods, regardless of whether there was a Democrat or a Republican sitting in the White House. Now, some people say, maybe I should just cash out and wait and, and see who wins. And if a Republican wins, I'll put my money back in. Or if a Democrat wins, I'll put my money back in to the market. 
And if you take a look at it for over the last 120 years, if you only, if you had invested $10,000 and you were only invested when Republicans were in office, your money would have grown to a couple hundred thousand dollars. If it was when Democrats were in, it would have grown to maybe a little bit more than that. But if you had stayed fully invested the whole time throughout both Democrat and Republican administrations, your $10,000 over 120 years would have compounded to more than $7 million. And if you think about it, I'm just gonna go back two charts here. If you think about just my time in the business, right, since 1987, we've lived through both, both Republican and Democrat administrations. We've lived through a stock market crash. We've lived through two Persian Gulf Wars. We've lived through the long-term care, uh, the long-term capital crisis in 1998. We live through the dot-com, 9-11, Enron, WorldCom bubble. We live, through, um, we live through the subprime mortgage crisis and the failure of AIG and, and Lehman Brothers and government bailouts in the TARP program. We live through the fiscal cliff, the Affordable Care Act. We live through, this is kind of interesting, we live through SARS. We live through uh, H1N1. We live through... Zika, we live through Ebola, and on the other side of this, we will come out on the other side of COVID-19. We're not sure when, but it's moving fast. And through all of those things, staying invested over long periods of time got people to the place they wanted to be. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at the growth, if you invested $10,000 on a day that the president was elected, how much it would be worth when they left, uh, when the, what, 10 years after they were elected, you can see almost all the time, your $10,000 in 10 years doubled in the stock market, sometimes substantially more than that. There's only been one exception to that, and that was poor George W. Bush, who, who came in at, you know, during the dot-com 9-11 time period, and left during the 08, 07, 08 financial crisis. And even though his presidency was bookended by two of the worst recessions since the Great Depression, if you had invested $10,000, you'd be down less than 10%, even if you had the worst timing. So time again versus, versus trying to time things and jump in and out tends to be a much bigger deal. So from that standpoint, what do we believe in? We believe we're optimists. I believe that the future is bright. I believe that there are challenges that we have in front of us, but we believe that free markets and capitalism and entrepreneurial spirit and innovation and technology will continue to drive us. I think one of the things people have to remember is that this is a market of stocks not a stock market. One of the things, uh, Nathan, I'm going to put you on the spot here, but Jeff saw it. What was it that he said about presidents and stock markets a couple weeks ago? Yeah, he said uh, that the markets make presidents, not presidents don't make markets. You know, and if you think about that, if the stock market goes up, the president always likes to claim credit for it. If the stock market goes down, the, the president, who, whoever's sitting uh, in the White House likes to blame other forces. But whoever is in the White House, think about it this way. Is there anybody on this call or is there anybody that you know who, depending on the outcome of the election on November 3rd, is going to stop taking their blood pressure, diabetes, or cholesterol medication? Is anybody going to stop shopping at grocery stores or buying things that they, that they want or need? Is anybody gonna stop buying the latest, greatest uh, technology iPhone or, or uh, entrepreneurial device that makes their life better? Um, is anybody gonna stop consuming electricity from Ohio Edison or your local utility company based on the outcome of the election? If the answer to those is no, those companies will still continue to innovate they will still have revenue, they will still have earnings, and those earnings will drive stock prices. So we believe free markets, capitalism, entrepreneurial spirit, 
innovation and technology will continue to drive. One of, the, one of the things that I subscribe to, I share it with Nathan quite often, is a weekly email from a, uh, from a technology leader. His name is Peter Diamandis. He, he writes a weekly blog post called The Abundance Insider. And The Abundance Insider takes the application of new technologies, whether it's blockchain or, or artificial intelligence, or um, biomedical engineering, or um, virtual reality, augmented reality, and so forth, and takes what's coming in these worlds and how fast they're moving and applies it to what's going on in agriculture, in, in uh, manufacturing, in healthcare, in finance, in whatever, um, in medicine and gives us an idea of where the market's going and where, where the economy could be headed over the next three to five years. One of the things that Wayne Gretzky said years ago that made him such a great hockey player is he skated to where the puck was going, not where it is now. Don't get so lost in what's going on at this moment that we lose where things are going in the future. And from that standpoint, the team at Impel Wealth Management is here to help. We're here to help with a number of things. We provide a weekly blog post and market commentary that either myself or Nathan write every week. We have our, we do financial planning for clients. We believe that all decisions that people make regarding their benefits, their salary, their tax situation, their, their 401ks, their benefits, their investment portfolio should all be based on a sound financial plan. And again, a financial plan should be individualized and tailored for you. We provide investment portfolio management. We do it on a fee basis. And uh, we've been, as I said before, named by Forbes magazine as one of the best in state wealth advisors for the third year in a row. So with that, um, I'm going to open it up for questions here in just a second. I should have mentioned this before, my fault. There is a button. It's either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on the device that you're on. And uh, from that standpoint, if you click that, there's a Q&A button there. And if you click that button, you can type in a question. And uh, we're here. We're more than happy to answer questions for you. So please feel free to do that. I'm going to let Nathan kind of moderate questions and uh, maybe throw out a first couple to us uh, as people are, are typing theirs in or sending those to us. Um, Nathan, any, any questions in the queue? Anything that we have to start with? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to summarize it. But basically, the, uh, the first question is, is around, uh, talked a lot about um, you know, history of elections and, and, and the, in the longer term future, what happens uh, in your opinion, Jess, in the event that there is a uh, contested election uh, coming up? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, I actually have read, you wouldn't believe the amount of material that, that I've read over the last, uh, well, we read on an ongoing basis, but uh, uh, about tax policy, about history, about uh, general policy platforms of each of the candidates and so forth. And I actually have a, a, uh, an article here that was titled, it's from September 23rd, so it's relatively recent, about a week ago from Brian Levitt, who's the global market strategist for uh, Invesco. And I don't know if we can see this, but the title of the article is, what happens if we don't know the election results for a while, right? And uh, so there have been a number of people who have been putting uh, some thoughts out there and so forth regarding this. And um, historically, if you see a, a contested election, uh, market volatility um, tends to pick up a little bit. Um, if we go back to the 2000 election, this is, this is where we've got to pay really close attention to a couple of things. One is, um, one is in the Bush-Gore election, the hanging chads, you know, in the state of Florida and so forth, the stock market dropped about four and a half percent from November 7th to December 13th. However, we've got to remember that this was also during the dot-com crisis and the stock market was already falling because of the dot-com bubble. So it's hard to say in that scenario 
whether the stock market fell further because of the dot-com crisis or whether it fell just because of hanging chads and this thing getting held up in the Florida and federal Supreme Courts. But these are things that uh, we do want to be aware of. I mean, a 4% correction in the market, 4 to 5% wouldn't be surprising. And I think a lot of people think that there may be some additional volatility, but we don't want people to, uh, to make long-term decisions based on a very short-term, you know, few week to a couple month period of time. Great, thanks, Jess. One other one that I've got so far, and it, it's on, uh, again, I'll try to summarize. It's, it's regarding, um, talked a lot about the presidential election, but we also know that there's, uh, I think all 435 House seats are up, plus uh, 30, was it 33 Senate seats are up for election right now? Yeah, I can't remember whether it's 33. I think there's 34 this time. I'm 34? Not, yeah. So as we look at those elections as well, any thoughts around if there's a uh, kind of divided uh, White House from Congress? Uh, different yeah, ways. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's also a really great question because really, if, if, if Biden gets elected, uh, the, only, the only way by a Biden policy, major policy initiative shift happens is if Biden gets elected and he gets the Senate. We think likely, based on, uh, based on the numbers, that it's likely that the House will remain Democratic. Uh, Democrat. So at this point in time, uh, there, the, uh, and I've done a lot of reading on this, and the most recent study that I saw that I thought was really well done said that in the Senate right now, you've got 53 Republicans, you've got 47 Democrats, or you've got 47, you've got a couple of independents that caucus with the Democrats. So they think that out of the 34 seats, I think 20, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, it's either 24 or 26 of them are Republicans. So there's a lot more Republicans defending seats this time than there has been historically. So that could throw things into some tumult. But then the other issue is that this, this study that I saw basically said there's about 10 of those 34 seats that are potentially up for grabs. The analysis that this group did was that it looked like three of those seats were going to go Republican, three of those seats were going to go Democrat, which leaves you back at 5347 with four seats up in the air. So a lot of time those seats tend to drift towards whoever wins the presidential election. So don't be surprised if we see 5149, if we see 5050, and if it's 5050, don't forget vice president, whether it's Mike Pence or Kamala Harris is the person that would end up casting the deciding vote. So quite honestly, what happens with the Senate is just as important, if not more important, than who wins the White House coming up. Great, thanks. Other than that, any other questions in the queue at this point, Nate? No, I was gonna say, those are the two that we have. Okay, so good. So first of all, thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm gonna pop this off here and say goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, our goal in these, in these webinars, these educational sessions is to number one, make sure that people have access to information, make sure that people are not making emotional decisions, but making decisions as much as possible based on fact and, uh, and, um, and not, not just fact, but based on historical patterns, based on good data so that they can move forward with that. And that also to make sure that everybody knows we're here to help. That's our goal. If, we, if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have questions about how this applies to you, please feel free to reach out to myself or Nathan. We're here for you and we look forward to talking with you soon. So thank you so much everybody for joining us today. Thanks and have a great day. Bye-bye.